What is going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Fire Builders Live. My name is Josh Corporal, and just like always, I am streaming live from Key West, Florida, from the porch. And today, I have a very special guest, Kenny Mamarella de Cruz. Kenny, welcome to the show. Thank you. I can't so, believe how badly I need a haircut. I'm looking at myself <laughs> here and thinking, I'm all lopsided. It's just, but hey. As it goes, we're here. You and me both. In fact, I think maybe what we could do is make our hair stand out a little bit farther. We could both do that. Do this. Got, yep, there we go. Perfect. <laughs> we're like brothers now. So, uh, so I can't wait to talk about this topic. But before we do, let me explain to everybody listening, watching at home what we do here on Fire Builders Live. We stream live Monday through Saturday, six days a week, my friend, and we take these big ideas and these big concepts and we break them down into small steps, things that you can do every day to improve yourself. And today is no different. Kenny here has quite the history. Let me explain a little bit about what this guy has done. It is fascinating. He has just lived a fascinating life, famously known as the man whisperer. That's right. The man whisperer. Kenny has been inspiring people all over the globe. His journeys have taken him to places like Fiji, like Sydney, Australia. He's been volunteering with Mother Teresa in Calcutta, right? He is now considered one of the UK's top personal development consultants, and he's been featured in places like the Huffington Post and Newsweek, helping men see the bigger picture of their lives so they can truly understand their past and transform their future. And I'll tell you, We'll go into it a little bit, but from an absolutely insane story of being declared enemies of the state by Idi Amin's Secret Service back in 1972 to understanding the different tribal rules, the ways of being, the belief systems, all the outcomes of various groups around the world. He helps people live happier and more fuller lives the way that we all want to. And that, my friends is why I am so excited to have Kenny on the show. Kenny, it is an absolute pleasure. <laughs> Welcome again to Fire Builders Live. Do you know what? Listening to you, I'm so excited to meet this bloke. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this guy with the crazy hair? <laughs> i tell you what, uh, it's going to be so good. Honestly, the more that we dug into your style, the, the way that you approach these types of problems, the way that you help people throughout the world, it was incredible. I mean, we, we both, both Brian, my production coordinator and I, we were just aghast at like, at all of the cool stuff that you've done. So man, I just have to say much respect to you, much respect. Thank you. Do you know, to be frank, I couldn't have planned it. I couldn't have worked that out. Um, I guess in a way, um, I handed my life back to wherever I need to be whatever I need to do. And then life really began because in control from my head, trying to put on a good show, I think that would be limited to what I've already had and it would go nowhere. Being in control, it's like good for survival and stuff, but to be able to follow life and to spot the clues and the signs and the temptations and the opportunities, these things can only come from, for some people, it's the little cracks in their lives where there's a little moment of out of control and then some goodness that slips in. And I realized that the best people in my life, the biggest opportunities, the coincidences, all of those, the magic happened beyond control. So I thought, that's permission. <laughs> exactly. Like, I, I think, I honestly, I think that what you said about control, and we can touch on this a little bit more on the show, because actually, for those that are listening, uh, both Kenny and I, we went through about a little over two hours together last night. Kenny was kind enough to stay up until past midnight uh, with me, his time, so that we could go through and talk about some of these issues, things that he does. It was in to least, uh, the thing that you talked about as far as control, I have, I got some really incredible insights and I think that you're right. I mean, I know that you're right. Uh, I just think that it's so important to kind of let that control go. But before we go any further, I do like to ask just so that we can get some context here. 
where are you in the world? And mm. nowadays, what is a typical day like in Kenny's life? My lounge. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, it's a nice lounge. <laughs> I'm in London, um, and I'm in the East End of London. I live with my wife, and uh, I do spend God knows how many hours in my lounge, and I've got a standing desk and a kneeling stool and a ball to sit on, and, you know, it's like I'm in my lounge. Day and night, I'm in my lounge, and I must admit, I am absolutely loving it. It's worked for me. It's really, really worked. Um, and it's been life changing. And in a strange, I used to say, you know, you mentioned the Mother Teresa thing. I used to say that the most useful I've been in my life when I was, is when I was working in Calcutta with dying people. Since lockdown, this is the most useful I've been in my life, without a doubt. And from my lounge, I remember a few days before lockdown, when um, I went into um, isolation because someone I worked with had the COVID symptoms. So I said, let's go into isolation. And from my lounge working and, you know, Zooming, um, I kept checking out of the window and I expected to see the military. Uh, and I kept lis listening out for gunshots. I, I was noticing that there weren't gunshots. I wasn't even listening for them. I was noticing, you know, it's like when the fridge goes off and then you notice yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, you notice like what's not there. Exactly, exactly. And I thought, well, that's a bit weird. What am I doing? And then I realized that I flashed back to when, we were, when I was a kid in Uganda and there was gunfire and the military were on the roads and there was curfew and people weren't allowed to be together. People, if you were together talking, then that could be conspiring against the government and you'd be in prison or in trouble or whatever. And you know how it is with the military. Well, maybe you don't know how it is in the, in the military, but in, in a lot of countries, they get drugged up because then they'll do things that they wouldn't do if they weren't drugged up. That's the way it goes. And especially if there isn't money or whatever. And also people who haven't had power suddenly have power. So I flashed right back. And thankfully, I followed the feeling and I realized where I flashed back to rather than feeling anxiety and dumping it on someone or dumping it in on myself and going in my head or drinking or whatever, however it would play out. And then a few days later, the country went into lockdown and I thought, stuff's going to be up. Stuff's going to be up big time. And what I can do now is I can put on daily groups. So people can show up and they can name how they feel and they can name their fears and their fantasies and how life is and what's going on. And just in speaking it out, it breaks the spell. And no longer do they need to fix it or fear it or feel like they're on their own or push it out on, you know, loved ones. Domestic violence rates have gone sky high. And then there's the other extreme pushing it in. And the suicide rates, the number of people that have come in and said, you know, I've got suicidal thoughts and stuff like that. But just being with other people and speaking it out and breaking the spell and not being fixed or saved or embarrassed or anything like that, but learning from other people's experiences has been worth its weight in gold. And one of the simplest, most important things that I show people to do is breathe into the fear breathe into what's going on rather than think, oh my God, a bad thing's here. I should suppress it, avoid it, deny it, run away from it. You know, try and run away from it. It's got no choice but to chase you until it's met and heard. So speaking it out makes the world of difference, but follow the feeling back and you know what's really going on. Mm -hmm. And that's what needs dealing with. And dealing with can be quick and easy. It's just sitting with it, meeting it, being with it, and then it will probably leave. Well, is that what you experienced? So when you followed the feeling back to the days of being declared an enemy of the state, right? So back in 72. That was my father, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Like, uh, I'm curious, just, I mean, because I personally am curious how much you remember about that time 
you know, you, you were what, eight years old? Yeah, seven. And then I turned eight <laughs> just before we left, mate. Yeah, yeah, seven. And uh, I remember it so clearly. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, and that fear that you felt, um, and that you followed back, like, you know, when all this lockdown <laughs> stuff happened, the idea was that you could follow that fear back to those emotions that you had when you were younger, right? Yeah. But because of that, there's some consolation in knowing where they're coming from, as opposed to sort of not knowing where they're coming from and then letting them manifest themselves in all kinds of unhealthy ways. As well as limit my life. So if I keep running and I'm not going to be available to certain parts of me and I'm in my head surviving, I'm not going to be available to life. So the magnificent thing that happened that I didn't expect to happen is as I explained this to people and as clients showed up who would usually not show up, the big burly business people, the rich and famous who can buy themselves out of everything, the jet set, party animals, whatever, they showed up because during lockdown, all the fixes are taken away. All the distractions are taken away. And nine out of 10 of them didn't realize that they were running or that there was anything up. And very, very quickly, we dropped into it and they flashed straight back to boarding school or whatever their trauma is or being locked in the laundry room for being bad or their abuse or even if it's something small that affected them because it doesn't have my story is dramatic so people like it doesn't matter how dramatic it is being bullied in the playground is bad enough yeah i feel like that that could be incredibly dramatic it's like <laughs> drama is sort of based on context right so when you're a kid that's the most important thing in the world at that exactly point. Exactly. And it's about the relationship to what happens. It's got nothing to do with how dramatic it is. It's the same with money. So many people chase money, chase power, etc. And a lot of my clients pretty much have everything. And then they realize that it hasn't brought them happiness or passion or intimacy or purpose or anything like that. It gets to a stage where the money owns them rather than them owning money or wealth. And what really makes them a wealthy person for me is their relationship to their money, their relationship to their lives, their relationship to what they do and who they are and why they're here, how fulfilled they feel. And you can't buy that. You can't do that, but you can be that. And that happens in the undoing. So the people I attracted since lockdown, phenomenal in the way that they found the issue. Firstly, something didn't feel right, something wasn't right. So they showed up, we quickly got there, we turned it around. And now they're living so much more fulfilled than when they were like jet set party animals. It's ridiculous the quality that this has brought. And it's not just busyness, it's the intimacy, it's the purpose, it's the passion. Most of, you know, with, with most things, if they don't work, just unplug it for a little while. <laughs> See what right, might just, exactly. <laughs> unplug it and then plug it back in, kind of thing. Exactly. <laughs> the I'm I'm so the people that you're working with. I mean, I think it's important to to touch on the fact that these people that you are attracting and that that are coming to you with problems, they have achieved great things in their life from a financial point of view or from a business point of view. They, you know, they've worked for the last 30 years or so head down strong, um, mm -hmm. building up incredible things. But yet when they start to have these realizations is a, is a massive concern that, that they've just not wasted so much time, but that they only have a short amount of time left. They're starting to realize that. And they're, you know, they're starting to reflect on like, maybe their own mortality and the things that they could have done, but not necessarily did. That bit doesn't last too long. Um, and the reason that doesn't last too long, it's important for that to be named and to kind of visit that, but to realize that some people, some, it's not even people for generations, people can never realize this. 
and it's build the wealth, save the wealth, become famous, um, or it, or it's inherited or whatever. And it's supposed you're supposed to be happy that you have the status and everything's kind of like hunky dory. But if it excludes this person, if the whole family are used to being excluded from love or from passion or from purpose, but keep the wealth coming in or put on a good show, what's the point? There's the, to be excluded from your own, your own life, what could be more tragic than that? And some of them, they're not all wealthy and they haven't all worked for it. And some people are actually quite happy and okay. They just realize that it's time for more. I've outgrown my life. I want more. I think that's great. I uh, Let me bring this up because as you're talking, I think this is important. So, uh, so Tara said, personal abyss manifestations, well, doesn't that take courage to give light to? I think that everybody has that and has the ability to do that. So it does take, it does take courage. And when we discussed that yesterday, the, yeah. the idea of, putting that vulnerability out into the world. Uh, and also, Born Bright, who's a friend of mine down uh, in Africa, he, uh, Kenny, what are the principles of true leadership, I think in men, not men's, but just in mm -hmm. men in general? What would you say to that? Listening, collaborating, and um, being true. I believe one of the main differences between boys and men is boys make a lot of noise to prove their masculinity uh, and need to have power over in the hierarchy, where men, it's more about being than doing, not really having much to prove. It's not about proving because that would mean I feel less than and I need to feel, to show you that I'm more. So. Men are in power and can empower others. Men can listen and respond where boys generally don't listen and they react. And reaction generally comes from fear and panic. I mean, there is a time and a place for reaction. If there's danger, react. But as a way of life, that's toxic. That's a lot of cortisol. And I know that through the traumas that I had in life, my body was addicted to adrenaline. And I needed to unlearn that and to come from endorphins, which is calm, and it grows good energy rather than it being manic and it drains and it just keeps being hungry for more and more. Um, and if I'm true to myself, then surely everyone around me has an invitation to meet in some truth and depth. If I'm putting on a good show, hoping everyone's going to like me, then I'm telling everyone else, you put on a good show, let's all be frauds together because this is the way to do it. It's not the way I want, it's not what I want to be around. That lacks the depth. It lacks a purpose. It lacks a unity. One of the really interesting stories that you told me last night was about, um, was about uh, uh, hunting lions, right? And, uh, and the group and how that, works uh do you want to i think it was a great example i think people would love to yeah. hear that i met this excellent guy in kenya and um thankfully he spoke perfect english and he told me about his initiation into being a man and um you know there are stories going around about you have to kill a lion but what i didn't realize was that he gets prepared the whole village, the men get prepared to go out into the jungle together. Well, I guess they kind of live there, but to go out together and to come from the right place. And for me, this is the intimacy amongst men and the trust in working together because the object of the exercise is that he kills a lion. In order to do that, as men, they need to go in quietly together, risk all their lives, to surround the lion so no one gets killed and he kills it not anyone else but he kills it and to be risking their lives and going in as a collective consciousness and being able to communicate with each other 
and be that in tune to do something with honor and respect. There's all, it's all, it almost feels sacred in a strange way. I mean, totally socially unacceptable to say this, I guess, but I'm telling his story and oh my God, I was so, so blown away when he told me about how it was and what it was like coming back to the village. There's another part of the story that I didn't tell you about. This is a bit of a oh, cheeky part. Hit me. <laughs> we got on great and, you know, we had some really great chats and he said, look, why don't you come and stay in my village tonight and you can choose which hut you want to sleep in. And before I did that, um, my, my father was born in Kenya um, and he, my father kind of knows some of the tribal languages and customs and things. He used to drive trains between Kenya and Uganda. Um, and he's basically said, do you realize that if you sleep in, you choose which hut and which wife comes with that hut and you put your spear out outside the hut and that means that you are in this hut and no other man enters. And you're obliged to um, be with that wife. And if you don't, it's a huge insult. So I didn't stay over. <laughs> no, you didn't make the choice. Were you married at the time? I wasn't, but. <laughs> <laughs> that idea of community, like I had no idea that, that, that they had that sense of that sense of community. The story about the lion is one thing, but then also like the sharing of, of love, like the, you know, the sharing of each other's wives and stuff as an act of respect to someone mm. coming in. I had no idea, no yeah. idea. And it's so easy to judge from our perspective of what's right, what's wrong, how should, how things should be, et cetera, et cetera. Before I left the UK, as, as you say, I traveled around a lot of countries and did a lot of things and, and took part in, really took part as much as I could um, with various cultures. I thought I had an idea about good manners and respect and, you know, how to be with people. Wherever I went, my God, I had so much to unlearn about my conditioning, my separation, my bad manners how separate I was um, and even in their culture if something was totally different to my culture I needed to experience myself coming from there to really question what is true for me not what do I judge as good or bad or, or right or wrong but I needed to know myself there and I have learned so much about myself by being accepted by different communities. It's been, it's been the hugest, biggest lessons in my life. And it's opened me up. You could say it's opened me up to vulnerability. It's opened me up to life. It's opened me up to people. It's opened me up beyond restriction to possibilities, to love, to connection. I'm sounding like a hippie now, eh? No, but it sounds like I can totally, I know so many people can relate to that. And when you say, you know, you had to unlearn things about what was right and wrong because because there are people that you meet along the way who have who have convictions just as strong as yours, but might be the exact opposite actual like procedure, you know, or or custom that you start to learn that there is no right and wrong. There really is just like you being in that space and 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 experiencing this from a completely different perspective. And that's yeah. what's so so magical about about traveling if you do it right i uh i i 100 agree i can relate to that and we were talking about india like mm. india i got a lot mm. of that mm. Mm. and the interesting thing is sometimes it's so much easier to relate it to india but to bring it back home and to be in at loggerheads with a friend or a colleague or a lover or whoever and have an argument rather than realizing actually not only am i right from my perspective but so are they 
And now what are we going to do? Now, where are we going to meet? Now, how do we take this further? It's fine to do it out there, but the only thing that exists is here and now. You know, as, as we talk about this, right? And let me touch on this because everything that I'm about to say from this point forward is my own personal experience with what we talked about yesterday, how we went through this whole process, which I thought was fascinating, by the way. Uh, but one of the insights that I came up with after listening to what we did was your idea of of being present in the moment and what that means you know what that means that as far as an opportunity to experience things as opposed to this protective sense of you always looking forward always you know pre-planning and making sure that you don't do anything stupid very systematic very regimented but in a way that ultimately just tries to stop you from not doing anything dumb and dying or falling off a cliff, right? Well, it occurred to me that in places like India, where you, you didn't know what was going to happen, you could not, that side of you, that protective side of you came from a place where, where it was just my experiences, my, you know, what I've experienced in the past, but it had no bearing on what I would experience in the future in India because it was so different. And because of that, it quiet, that side of me quieted down and that free spirit side of me instead was able to live on and, you know, and flourish and whatever that when I feel excited about talking about India, that is exactly why. And I realized that this morning based on, and I feel like that's why a lot of people love travel because they can't predict what's going to happen. So it lets yeah. that side of them quiet down and that free spirit risk taking like beautiful dynamic side of them absolutely thrive in that environment. So can I throw something back at you that sure. I said earlier myself and earlier it was said that the way is to be out of control. So based on last night, what would be a, a safe or a grounded or a realistic, a wise way to be out of control without being stupid, without taking dumb risks? Are you asking me right now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what would be a way? I personally, uh, I think that the, the balance between that protective side of you and that free spirit, but but being able to identify that, being a little bit more cognizant um, about that, that give or take, like that meeting of the, of the middle mm -hmm. is important. Um, because like you said, you know, you, you can only get so out of control before your, the part of your brain kicks in where it says, whoa, 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 like back off a little bit. Let's, let's rein it back. Don't make me take over because I will, I will turn this car around, right? <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah. But, but finding a balance between that voice that everyone has in their own head and the voice that says, let's just go out and do it. Let's mm -hmm. just go out and explore and not worry so much and see what happens. Uh, I find that to be fascinating. And it's your approach to how to get in touch with both of those sides. I've never done before. And I thought it was, I thought it was incredibly effective. I love it. It was such a buzz. I love being in that space. And it's different for different people. But the amount that can be done doing it that way in two hours, inside, this is like totally bypassing the head, but including so much more than ideas and information and memory. It's getting deep into the different parts and the essence and the purpose and the fears and even the aspects of the story that are important straight in there and may as well deal with it at the core rather than talk about it forever or try and fix it or agreed <laughs> i mean you're right like the separation um you know because everybody has those that yin and yang that uh, that balance of power that goes on inside them and and actually not only for everybody listening, like what we ended up doing was we treated each one of those sides of your personality as separate people. And we spoke from just that space. 
And you actually did something really cool, which in retrospect, I'm like, yeah, it makes total sense, was you had me move physically to a different <laughs> location, right? Talk about you know one side of the personality, then go back, reset, move to a separate location, talk about the other side. That just the, the physical presence of being somewhere else helped in this whole process. It was, it was great, man. I like, I got so many great insights. Do you take, so you say it's different for everybody, but do you take the same approach generally with, with everyone? Generally, vaguely, yes, but it depends on the individual and where they are. It depends on what's up. And for me, it's whatever's the most efficient, the most sustainable, and I don't wish to make a meal of things. So rather than going all over the place and not missing out on something, that's overdoing it. It's getting to the core and basically empowering you so you know how to do it. It belongs to you. It can't be taken away. You know what it feels like. And my favorite bit was as you took a position and it was like, how do I do this? And within a few minutes, you've moved into it, your face changed, your body changed, your breathing changed, your voice changed, and you were so embodied in what I believe to be the most important position to move things forward. It was magnificent to just see that change before my eyes so quickly. You were there. I could see you. I can't wait for you to see you there when you're watching I, the recording. I haven't been able to watch it yet, but I will. And I'm going to look for that because you're right. I felt it. I felt the change. I really did. I'm not just saying that. I really actually did. Uh, and I've never felt that before. So that I can't wait to watch it. I can't wait to see what the hell I looked like. <laughs> you know? I, uh, I did want to ask because I think it's a good question. As we're, I mean, we're talking about men. You're the man whisperer, for God's sakes. Uh, but... I'm sure that you have had this before, and I think it's it's um, it's important to bring up wisdom thoughts from for you know for women for the female side of things. Is it any different? Is it vastly different than what you would say for men? I wouldn't say it's vastly different, but there are differences, um, and the main differences I would say are the experience of the vulnerability of a woman. Um, you and I can travel India and Africa and wherever we want. If I was a woman on my own, I'd think twice before going to the shop late at night. Here, very, very different experience. Plus, to be protecting myself throughout my life, especially puberty and being a woman as a sexual being, other people's projections, etc. It's absolutely shocking how many men have been through abuse, including sexual abuse, a lot more than people would realize, a lot more than the men even remember sometimes. And it's off the scale with women in comparison. And that is a huge difference in the spirit of a woman. Um, and I would say another very, very important and often avoided difference is hormones. I cannot imagine what it's like to have female hormones that change, not only once a month, but before, during, and after having a child, perimenopause, menopause, and everything else. I can't imagine that in a million years. I know how I change with when the full moon's brewing, and a lot of men, the days before a full moon can be very charged. Emotional, vulnerable and that generally becomes a short fuse and anger it's just a lot more charged i know what it's like to have testosterone and that drive me totally bonkers for decades and i don't think a lot of women can understand that um, and generally it's like well how do i control my unruly child and this is mothers and fathers by no means am i blaming women and generally sadly that's humiliation and abandonment, or these days sticking him in front of a screen as well. But it's this- these... Humiliation and abandonment as in that those are the methods to control the child as yeah. opposed, yeah. And every man, I would say, fears humiliation and abandonment probably more than anything. And the most hilarious thing about what men make personal is 
women's hormones. It's like, how do I fix that? What have I done wrong? What's it got to do with you? <laughs> yeah. Try and extend as much as you can to what she might be going through and ask rather than, oh my God, I must have done something wrong. How do I fix this? And making it all about poor little man me. There's so much that I will never, ever perceive of. And we need to find out. We need to be talking about these things. And I'm totally all for equality. And this surely needs a sharing of information so we can support each other. I think it's tragic the way people don't know about hormones and make allowances, including in the workplace, including the space that women need in certain times of month, rather than putting on a good show and carrying on as they are including the space that men need because my wife knows at least a couple of days before the full moon and at the full moon i need my space i need to move i need to stay up i need to go out with my friends i just need some space because otherwise i'm going to be like american werewolf in london <laughs> <laughs> I, that's it's interesting i've never heard about guys reaction to a full moon like that that i've never yeah. heard of that before um Apparently, there are statistics. Um, I've been told that there's a lot more crime, violent crime. Uh, there's a, a lot more. Well, I, I, in the days that we were allowed out, I would plan where the, if there is a full moon, then for the days before the full moon, I probably wouldn't travel home too late on the underground because there would be a sex vibe. There'd be a lot more drinking. There'd be a lot less inhibitions. There'd be a lot more lariness going on. And I just can't be bothered with it. So I plan, and when there's a full moon, I know that my phone's going to be busy. I make space in my diary because there are going to be people that need some attention. And I'll account for that. And I know that the boring stuff that I wouldn't be able to do them during the month, admin or whatever it is, I'd save it for then and I would bang through it like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> you may as well harness the energy yeah. and put it to good use. It's That's right. Just, you know, I need to own it. Exactly. Yep. You know, I, uh, I down here in Key West, I mean, pretty much anywhere in the States from what I understand, but specifically down here, you can request from the police department what's called a ride along where you can ride along with an officer for a shift you know, the six, seven hours or so no. and do, do what they do. Right. And, uh, and, well, and not I'm to a point where they give you a gun or anybody and they need like, Hey, come on, we're going to go like storm this house. Like not that, but anyone can do this. It's wow. part of the public service. And so I did this years ago, like 15 years ago down here in Key West. And it happened to be on a full moon and the weird shit that we saw that th that people would be doing like you just have no idea until you see it firsthand yeah. so i can i can relate uh, like to the fact that there's some weird stuff that goes on guys and girls but you know i wonder whether this is one of the differences between men and women as well because you know that red mist when the red mist drops then the craziness is there someone's going to go off I've had it. I've, I've seen it in the eyes of my father. And thinking about it now for the first time, I don't remember ever seeing that or knowing that in women. I've seen that in men, where suddenly something has taken over and it's too late. It's gone. He's left the room and there is some maniac in his place for, yep. it, for a while. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I don't know if I've ever seen it either. I don't know if I've ever seen it either. But I know what you're talking about, where you just, where that switch just flips. Yeah. And it's it's all about, you know, survival at that yeah. point. Like, that's where the decisions are based out of at that point. I I honestly, man, this is such a fascinating conversation. I, uh, I'm curious because we didn't even get into the question. <laughs> I like to ask people all the time, you know, if they're, if there would be one thing that you would suggest that men, possibly even women, could do on a daily basis to ground themselves a little bit more, uh, 
to be a little bit more present in their lives, what would you suggest? Okay, how about three at the top of my head? Okay, let's do it. Num number one is in any and every moment, ask yourself, is this true right now? And very often I found with myself that whatever I'm trying to figure out, whatever I'm thinking, whatever's going on, it's either something from the past that is no longer going on at all and I no longer need to survive, or it's a fear or a fantasy from the future, or it's someone else's opinion. And right here and right now, it's simply not true. And man, game changer. I get my life back. I'm not trying to fix these things. And I'm here and able to take part in life rather than stepping back, trying to figure something out. So that's number one. Number two, and I guess for mine, it's it's in the moment rather than in the day. Number two is what I, I, I showed you last night is um, I used to be addicted to my thoughts and my second guessing and my fears and my fantasies um, and everything I was trying to fix. That didn't exist. And I needed a way of turning around and coming back here. And it was an addiction. And, you know, this is, this is survival, breaking the old survival wiring. So as soon as I caught myself lost, lost in space, in the space between my years, then I had to learn to stop before I even get to the end of the sentence. Take a deep breath in, and as I breathe in, think, thank you for reminding me who I used to be. And it's used to be, so it's in the past. And as I breathe out, I take part with what's in front of me, so I can get present and connected, out of my head and fear, embodied and able to take part. And there is gratitude for who I used to be, because, all that thinking saved my life, but I'm no longer on the front line. So I need to acknowledge and honor that and not make um, an enemy of it and get present and connected. You know, like and, almost to, to not necessarily invalidate those old feelings, recognize that they, they played, they played the part that they needed to play, but they're no longer, they're no longer either necessary, useful at this point, something like. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. Number three for me, and I hope everyone's got one of these. Number three for me is I listen to my inner DJs. And my inner DJs <laughs> are generally playing a tune. And the tune is generally a message. Like if I listen to the words or the feeling of the tune or where the tune takes me or the attitude that I need to have. And if there isn't a tune, then it's like, look around. What is life telling me? What are the clues? What are the signs? What are the temptations? But what are the clues here? Because I believe, and maybe this is just me playing with life, but I believe that I'm Columbo. And <laughs> life, around, <laughs> life around is giving me clues. I just need to see them and see whether it's true or not and see what's the same temptation and see what's the sign and move forward with that. And if I'm not looking, if I'm too busy surviving or with my head down or figuring things out, then life can't meet me. Nothing can meet me because I'm busy in my head. So I look for the clues. And very often the inner DJs really help with my attitude or they really let me reach inside so I know which attitude to use to relate outside. But it's all clues, and I'm not a victim to any of this. And with the signs and the temptations, I feel that the reason I'm given temptations, whether I fall for them or not, is so life knows how much I can take. And life knows not to give me more than I can take, but to give me enough so I can grow. So I'm stimulated. So that way, life's on my side and it can move me forward gently. Do you think the, the context of those clues that you see, like you see this as a positive clue, for instance, it has to do with, like, I guess what I'm saying is, do sometimes you see what you want to see? Like, because they're not obviously objective clues, but necessarily it's just, helping you to articulate the things that you either want to know or feel like are true for you in that present moment? 
I guess in a way you're asking me, is life like Facebook and Google, that, that it would feed back to me? <laughs> sort of, like, but, but in a way that the, in a way that the advertisements were all blank and you just saw what you wanted to see in that moment based on where you were right then and there. Yeah, I believe that if I did, if I used them to justify myself, then I'd miss out on the whispering and I might get a bit of a shout from life and I might get a bit of a slap from life and it's going to keep knocking on my door until I finally listen. And the sooner I listen, the less it's going to stuff me up. Slap you around a little exactly, bit. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And it's not bad for me when life brings things up that are uncomfortable. I believe that it's saying, here is your doorway. This is something you need to know yourself with, just as we did while we were abroad. Know yourself here and include this or release this or whatever, because when you have, then it's no longer going to restrict you. And there's so much more of you available to life and so much more of life available to you. So it's all about more. And the polite way, the traditional way is hover above the pain, don't go into it, survive it, and stay in that tension. It's tension. But I found to go in it and through it is to be liberated from it. And I also feel that it might not be that safe or as good a ride if it's done alone. So if you have a friend, um, People have coaches, therapists, whatever, the men's groups, the women's groups, things like that. People who are not only caring of you, but people who want the most of, for you to have the most of your life beyond what they want from you. And very often people come to the men's groups um, because they can find out who they are, let go of who they no longer need to be and really make space for who they are. And no one has any designs on who they should be. We're in the question together, rather than in certain friendship groups or family groups. It's don't change. We like it as it is. Right. There's conditions attached. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I man. I honestly, I love, I love this conversation. I love everything that you're saying. It makes so much sense. I have to bring up a couple of comments too that have come up since uh, since we've been talking. Number one, we pull this up from Lyndon. Kenny, I feel like you're the human whisper, not just be, not just the man whisperer. There are many universal genderless messages in your words. So thank you. That is very nice. That's so cool. Thank you. So I didn't make up the man whisperer. I'm not that smart. <laughs> <laughs> Newsweek wrote a chapter in a book that I, I, I knew they were doing a, a magazine article. So I thought, great. The next thing I know, there's a book out and they write a chapter about me and call me the man whisperer. How cool is that? <laughs> yeah, I feel like that's not a nickname that you can give yourself. You can't even really give yourself exactly. a nickname. It's just not the same. Not the same. Uh, and by it's the way, to do that. Uh, we have you have a wonderfully calming voice. But not wow. just that, right? Your hair looks perfectly <laughs> good. So thank you so much. You are amassing fans by the minute. Uh, Honestly, this has been such a great conversation. I know that there are some people that would like to continue it with you. So uh, what is the best way to do that, to get in contact with you? Themanwhisperer.co.uk is my own website. And it's so embarrassing that even my clients say, you need to take that down. It's rubbish. It doesn't do you justice. But it's there, and I'll, I will un I'll, I'll redo it at some stage. It's like throwing stuff at a wall because it needs to go somewhere. So you can go there, but I'll apologize now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you go to mensgroups.co.uk, um, there is um, there, there are all sorts of freebies there. You can join the men's groups from anywhere in the world every day, and it's by donation. So. And then there are women's groups every fortnight, young men's groups, mature men's groups. I, I train people. There's a day training on how to hold groups. And you can get a link to my, I didn't, oh, I'll show you. Oh, let's see. Cardboard cutout of my ebook. And check it out. Can you see the man talking 
and the man listening in the M. Oh, nice. I can I see that. <laughs> so that's my ebook. And the ebook gives you loads of tools, like the stuff I've been talking about, and a whole lot more to do it yourself, whether you're going to hold groups or do it in your business or do it in your life or fall in love with people and just show them how aware you are and showing up with an open heart and all of that. But I think on Amazon, it's still 99 cents or pence or something. Um, and there's freebies on there. But yeah, come play and hang out. And I want to share all my tools and pass it on, basically, because then I, I just get a better world to live in. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're right. Like, uh, and it's it's a situation where where I feel like you get out of it what you put into it. So by by just simply showing up and simply just talking about a lot of this stuff, particularly with men, it is incredible the kinds of shifts that can happen. And I, I I'm saying this from personal experience, having talked to you last night. Like, uh, it it was just it was an incredible experience. It really was. Uh, and so I'm so looking forward. To watching you further. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation and seriously, just taking right. the time to hang with us and explain some of this stuff. Very appreciative. I've, do you know, one last thing actually is um, I did uh, a workshop called Epiphany on Epiphany. And it's about how to come from the place inside to gain your own epiphany. And during the workshop, I did a meditate. I haven't listened to it yet. I hope it's good, but people say it's good. And I think we've put it on the YouTube channel. Um, I'd tell you what my YouTube channel's called, but I don't know. But I'm <laughs> sure <laughs> on one of the websites or, or email, and I'll tell you. But apparently, and it kind of puts things together vaguely similar to what we did last night. So that might be something that people might want to listen and go on a, it's only recently I've started um, doing meditations. I, I, I was a bit shy actually, <laughs> but well, since lockdown, it's more opportunity and it seems to work. Absolutely. And I'll, uh, and what I'll do is I will search that out and I will put it into the show notes so that there's the link right there oh, cool. connected Excellent. with this show so that people can go and check that out too. Yep. Brilliant. Excellent. Penny. What a buzz. It's brilliant to hang out with you. Sam, I feel the exact same way. Seriously, this has been so good. It's been 50, almost 53 minutes of a conversation and it has flown by. Before we wrap up, um, is there any last tidbit of wisdom that you would like to leave people before you, myself? Elvis has been respectfully quiet today. Is Elvis uh, the rooster. rooster. Elvis oh, is the rooster. I love that sound. <laughs> <laughs> great, great rooster. Sometimes uh, needs to listen a little bit more than he's talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know, the way I sign off with my newsletters is be the love, share the love. And surely it's as simple as that. Done. I love it. Succinct, beautiful. Kenny, you are the man. Uh, <laughs> seriously, this has been so good. So that's it. Lyndon actually was kind enough to put up your YouTube channel. Oh, cool. So there you go. And now you know it's Kenny DeCruz Tube. That's Is your it? I didn't know that. I thought someone told me it was Kenny the Man Whisperer. Maybe he's right. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. And by the way, she says, Elvis feels heard. Therefore, he is being instead oh. of yelling. Oh, Elvis. <laughs> He's got a lot of work to do internally, that rooster. <laughs> uh, but uh, but yes, this has been so great. So, Kenny, thank you again. This has been nice. such a wonderful conversation. And, uh, and guys, Josh, Kenny, Elvis, signing off. Another episode of Fire Builders Live. I hope you enjoyed it. Just to remind you. We stream live six days a week, Monday through Saturday. So check us out for another amazing episode. Go to firebuilderslive.com if you want to help support the show and get a whole bunch of freebies. And that is it. Kenny, this was amazing. You were amazing. Uh, thanks again. How are you? Bye. All right. See you guys. Adios. <laughs>